I embarked on my beloved conversation's journey with many questions and even doubts about his usefulness to me in my place here in the church. The journey began with a weekend retreat at Unity Temple in Oak Park with close to 100 other UUs from around the Chicago area, including almost 20 from here in the UCE. I quickly discovered how lucky I was to have grown up with parents who truly valued inclusivity, but also how little I knew about my own white identity and its privileges that I just took for granted. This retreat was followed by eight Monday evening intensive conservation conversation circles with seven other UCE members where we got to share our own experiences witnessing and addressing white racism in our lives and in our church. And then we experimented with ways to deal with both overt and sublimated microaggressions and other manifestations of our privileged lives. I came away from these sessions with a better knowledge of what people of color in our society must deal with every day, with tools that I can use to intervene when I witness or am part of a racist behavior, and with a commitment to leverage my own white privilege to create a more level playing field for people of community, of color in my community. In short, my beloved conversation's journey was eye-opening, uplifting, and energizing, and left me with the hope that all of us here at UCE can find the time to enroll in the upcoming Beloved Conversations program. To that end, Martha is at the rear of the church, and uh, she'll sign you up if you haven't already signed up. It is my hope that our Black Lives Matter sign on our church lawn is not only a challenging slogan, but also a way of life for all of us. Thank you. Beloved Conversations can meet you where you are on your journey to understanding the racial inequalities in our nation and community and help you to address that in your own life and in our church. I found the time commitment to be both reasonable and worthwhile and the sessions to be both highly structured and aptly facilitated. It began with a retreat that included other congregations and was followed by eight small group sessions that met here locally. So why is Beloved Conversations for everyone? First, I believe that being in a small group here is a wonderful way to build community. I'm new to Evanston and this provided an immediate connection to others with shared values and naturally helped me to build relationships while we shared personal experiences, reflected on our church history, and collaborated on ways to move forward in our faith community. The second reason why I believe Beloved Conversations is for everyone is that I believe it addresses the deep racial inequalities that continue to exist in the U.S. and that it's the new civil rights movement of our day and that all Americans have a responsibility to educate themselves and take action. While overt discrimination no longer enjoys the support of the majority of Americans, practices that maintain racial inequities are embedded in our daily lives. Schools, workplaces, houses of worship, politics, economics, and urban planning are all impacted by the subtle power of institutionalized racism. We can no longer believe that because we did not personally create the present situation, we are not responsible to fix it. The reality is that political and economic power and resources largely reside with people who are white, and they have for the history of our nation. Beloved Conversations has helped propel me in my journey of reckoning with my own white privilege and my own responsibility to bring issues to light and take action to confront them. I grew up in a small rural farming community in Indiana where almost everyone was just like me in the color of their skin, their basic Christian religious framework, and their Midwestern values. I was part of a large entrepreneurial and successful extended family which boosted my worldview that we had the truth and we were leaders. 
In time, life has taken me on a more honest path towards the responsible search for truth and meaning. In 2012, when I was in my early 40s, I moved to the North Shore of Chicago, and here I finally began to grapple with my own assumptions around meritocracy justifying inequality. While my worldview had expanded significantly since my sheltered childhood, I still believed that being colorblind was the way forward in my interactions with others. While I comprehended the vastly differing resources and life skills that people grew up with, I still mostly believe that existing inequalities could be fixed by people taking advantage of opportunities. I saw my success as a result of my own hard work and didn't adequately understand all of the privileges my race had contributed to my life story. The Unitarian Universalist Association common read for 2015 was the book Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. In many ways, I was primed to hear his message, and it rocked my world. It sent me into a, my own deep dive into what the truth of American history looked like, what the current plight of racism in America still continues to look like, and my own white privilege. Brian Stevenson came to the North Shore to speak, maybe some of you heard him, and I attended. His takeaway message for what to do with all of this was, get proximate. My family's answer, my family's answer to how to get proximate was to move. We had settled for six years in the super zip of Deerfield. There we lived in an affluent white neighborhood with excellent schools for our kids, and we had a wonderful life. Our home was in walking distance of two nearby parks, and we later learned those parks were, um, those, that land was meant to be used for affordable housing around 1960, but that the community had shunned and turned, away, turned that away. Getting proximate for us meant a move about a year ago to a diverse city like Evanston on a street in the largely black Fifth Ward. Here we have been able to not only have genuine friendships with people of color, but also to find meaningful ways to get involved in Evanston's efforts to address racism. Being a part of Beloved Conversations has helped me to find the courage to show up in spaces where I know I will make mistakes, but that I know I need to be. Thank you to my small group leaders in helping me along this path through Beloved Conversations. Kind of hard to follow those, but um, I'll start. I work in a field where technology and society and design and research intersect. Beloved Conversations has not only opened my eyes to the systemic racism that I have benefited from my entire life, and has made me much more aware of the way data and tech continue to perpetuate that racism. In her book, Technically Wrong, Sexist apps, biased algorithms, and other threats of toxic tech. Sarah Wachter Betcher writes, no matter how much tech companies talk about algorithms like they're nothing but advanced math, they reflect the values of their creators, the programmers and product teams working in tech. The same biases that lead teams to launch a product that assumes all users are straight, or a sign-up form that assumes people aren't multiracial or would lead them to launch machine learning products that are just as exclusive and alienating, and even worse, locked in a black box where they are all but invisible. I want to share with you all a few headlines that I've seen on my news feed since beginning Beloved Conversations in the fall of 2018. From Zillow Research, Home values remain low in the vast majority of formerly redlined neighborhoods. From Business Insider, a new study found that self-driving vehicles may have a harder time detecting people with dark skin. And it could point to a bigger issue with how the technology is tested. This is from an ACLU series. With AI and criminal justice, the devil is in the data. An excerpt from the ACLU article helps explain all three of the headlines. 
The data provides a distorted picture of the neighborhoods where crime is happening that, in turn, drives more police to those neighborhoods. The result, as mathematician and data scientist Kathy O'Neill calls it in Weapons of Math Destruction, is a pernicious feedback loop where the policing itself spawns new data which justifies more policing. I see beloved conversations and beloved community as a verb now. It is not just a curriculum and it does not end when you finish the class. Every day, as I am fed a constant stream of information, I stop and actively seek out technologists, teachers, designers, writers, and artists of color and conscience. I choose where I eat, what I watch, and how I speak with much more care. The hope is that in making small choices every day, online, and in, in real life, by speaking up, by bearing witness, that I can make a change in the overall systems and maybe tweak the algorithm against the racist paradigm and towards a system that actually sees people of color. We all have the power to break through racism, but it's not gonna happen until we see the racism in all areas of our lives, including the data sets. Thank you.